some of you might recall, and Chris, this is just, uh, he was a, a, a speaker here a year and a half ago, in January, January last year, and it was the, the highest attended um, uh, meeting we've ever had uh, since today. Uh, 60, 60, 70 people. It was a big one. So uh, um, this time, Stuart's promised to pull no punches. And, uh, I didn't realize we pulled punches last time, but uh, <laughs> so we're looking forward to that. Um, Stuart's made uh, presentations to hundreds of audiences internationally. Um, he's got a degree from Columbia um, and the University of Florida. He's, he has an extensive, varied background in education, science, business, and environmental pursuits. While at Merrill Lynch in 1978, he was the first environmentalist stockbroker on Wall Street, uh, representing the financial community at US Department of Energy hearings. He's worked for IBM and headed consultancy to New York City Mayor's Bank. Uh, more recently, he's been professor of mathematics, statistics, and critical thinking at Honolulu, Hawaii. Stewart is an environmental advisor and lobbyist within the state of Hawaii and provides sustainability consulting, education, and training. He's a participant at this year's UN climate negotiations, aiming to ensure a climate treaty Copenhagen at, uh, by year's end, um, strong enough to avert climate disaster. So without further ado, let me Stuart start. First, can I ask, silence them, turn them off. I forgot yesterday until um, I think I was already on uh, making my presentation on, you know, Murphy's Law, if you forget, it's going to happen. Anyway. Um, thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, I, um, I gave a presentation here two years ago. Was anybody present for that? Okay, there are a couple people. There's a very small overlap, and it's only for two people. That is, uh, a few slides may look familiar, but I figure once every two years you can use to see some of this material. It's uh, that shocking. Uh, let me get right into it, because I have uh, quite, quite a, a number of slides to, uh, to present. I tend to walk around a lot when I do present, so there we go. Um, I call my, my presentation The Climate Crisis. Um, I hesitate to call it the climate catastrophe because that makes it sound like it's a done deal. But uh, the, the shock that I am delivering today, I'm, I'm aiming to upset your appetite, I have to say. I'm sorry about that. But, uh, the, the, the shocking part of, of what I have to say is that uh, scientists seem to be uh, saying that we're already over the edge. We're already over the edge in terms of uh, the downhill slide towards a, a, a sixth ex uh, extinction episode. So we are trying to muster whatever political will we can, whatever will on social and spiritual levels we can towards getting back up to uh, a survivable track. So I regard this as the most urgent thing on the planet right now. And uh, I thank you for uh, letting me speak to you and try to enlist you. Uh, I've worked with Al Gore. Uh, some of the slides that I, I use are ones given to me by him, and those I'm not supposed to give out. So but I will, if anybody wants any of my slides, try to make as many available as I can. Um, I've also worked briefly with uh, Regina Pachari, who is the uh, chairman of the IPCC, the Governmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, 2,500 some, some odd scientists, the consensus of whom is that we've got a problem. Now, I always try to start with this slide, very familiar, iconic image of Earth. The only one that we have to this day, as far as I know, that shows the entire Earth in illumination. Just the chance moment with an astronaut being at the right place at the right time and catching the that beautiful view of our home planet. And I use this to illustrate the point, to ask a question, can you see the atmosphere of the Earth? Now, the first temptation is to say, well, here's the atmosphere of the Earth. But no, it looks like it's painted on. You're seeing clouds, but they look flat. Even though it's a flat screen, I'll grant you that. They look flat. Look to the edge and tell me if you can see any atmosphere. Now, standing up this close, I can see a tiny bit of blurriness, but I realize that's the pixelation. <coughs> Because the atmosphere of the Earth, in proportion to the diameter of the Earth, is about 1,000 to 1. Okay, so that, for 
this diameter, one one thousandth of that diameter is the thickness of the, of the atmosphere. And one of the sources of our problem is that we evolved, our nervous system evolved, our perceptive abilities evolved with the mistaken view that the atmosphere was huge. As Dennis in the audience re remarked yesterday, if you go, take a couple of st stops on the sky train, you've already traveled to the upper limit of the atmosphere. That's how little there is of it. So we have grown up as a society with the mistaken notion that nothing that we do can affect the atmosphere. A dreadful mistake. And that one is something we have to correct as quickly as possible. Now, here's a slightly better view, which gives you an idea of that thin, thin layer of atmosphere. If I was able to hold the globe in my hands, the atmosphere would be a coat of paint, that thin. And we have polluted the atmosphere with an, an unwinged outgas of our industry, of our successful population of the planet, which is carbon dioxide. We've learned in the last couple of hundred years how to dig coal from the ground, how to pump oil from the ground. We're helping ourselves to hundreds of millions of years of stored, sequestered carbon, and we're burning it in just a couple of hundred years. Aside from the notion of, well, gee, shouldn't we leave something for our kids, our misguided economic system is rapaciously consuming that energy and spewing the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which creates a big problem for us. Now, I have only, this is only the second time I've presented where I'm leaving out the slides I have on what powers global warming. So I'll just have to describe that quickly. You put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more of the heat that's generated by incoming sunlight is captured by the atmosphere, and the planet warms gradually. More carbon dioxide, more warming. Now, we don't call the problem global warming anymore. Those who would deal with it call it climate crisis or climate problem. Because if you call it global warming, then one year you have a cool winter and people say, oh, you see, I told you so. It ain't happening. Again, it's the problem is our perceptive abilities. We have very short memories. We only understand what's happening now, what happened yesterday, and that's it. Can you remember what you had for breakfast a week ago today? Remember if you had breakfast a week ago today. What I'm going to embark on now is showing you the, the dangers that we have, have spawned with our misuse of planetary resources, hoping that I can move this audience a little bit more towards um, helping solve the problem. So I know there's a lot of talent and influence in this room. Kilimanjaro, there's a very famous story by Ernest Hemingway, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, a short story in which he uses that snow-covered mountain that has been covered with ice and snow ever since people walked the planet. He uses, that as, uh, uses it as a symbol of undying love. 1970, 2000. In 2005, for the first time, Kilimanjaro was ice and snow free in summertime. Some of it comes back in, in winter, but the glaciers are gone. Kilimanjaro is no longer a snow-covered mountain perennially. Not unique to Africa. Alaska, much further north, much colder, 1914, the Portage Glacier, 2004. This is one of the Austrian Alp, Alpine glaciers in 1906, more recently. 97% of the world's glaciers are declining. There are a few that are particularly located still in cold enough areas that are receiving more precipitation than usual and are growing. But the vast majority are declining or shrinking. In Nepal, where the glaciers are so numerous that they're numbered by our western system, AX10 in 1978, in 2004. All over the world this is occurring. One of the extremely dangerous phenomenon is the melting of the Himalayan ice pack because seven of the world's major rivers, the Indus, the Ganges, 
the Brahmaputra, the Salween, the Mekong, which forms part of the boundary of Thailand, the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers. Those seven rivers support a vast amount of population. It's said that 40% of the world's population requires that watershed. If we melt the Himalayan ice pack, there will be a lot of people very thirsty. There will be a lot of starvation from the lack of water to irrigate fields. We're talking about a massive humanitarian problem. Here's an aerial view of some of the lakes that are forming at the extents of the glacial ice pack in Himalaya. Now these are lakes that are locked in by ice, and if that ice melts further and they release their waters, you have potential catastrophes from flooding downstream. Now let's switch to another glacier for a moment. This is a uh, Peruvian glacier where I want to show you the edge to establish the idea that glaciers build up by deposition of ice and snow year after year. Freezing, thawing, but more and more every year. And those striations, those levels, are like the rings of a tree. And they afford scientists an ability to drill an ice core and extract tiny bubbles of air that were trapped in the snow as the snow fell in that glacier. So the scientists go down to the furthest they can get from industry. And they go down to the South Polar ice cap. And they find pristine areas where they can drill down with hollow core bits, extract ice cores, lay them out, slice them up, extract these tiny bubbles, and analyze what's in them. And by the analysis of the content of these bubbles, they can establish two things. Not in terms of an annual, a yearly, but in broad terms, how the temperature of the planet has varied over the eons, and how the concentration of carbon dioxide has varied over the eons. And their record currently goes back 800,000 years. BP is before present. From present, back 800,000 years. The blue is the record of carbon dioxide concentration over the past 800,000 years. And if you notice, there has never quite been below one spiked tiny bit below 180 parts per million of volume. 180 out of a million carbon dioxide. And it has never been as much as 300. The peak seems to have been just about 290 or so. So let's establish 300 as the all-time peak, if you will. And I will use that number later. Let's compare that record with the record of temperature. The way they establish temperature is that there are two isotopes of oxygen which vary in their relative concentration in the atmosphere depending upon the temperature of the planet. So by extracting the oxygen and comparing how much O15 and how much O16 there is, you can get an idea of how warm or cool the planet was. Now notice the correlation of peaks to troughs. It's not lockstep, it's not ironclad, but there's a strong correlation there. Now, I am a teacher of statistics, and whenever I present this, I remind people, even if they haven't taken statistics or don't remember their statistics, that just because two things correlate doesn't mean that they cause one another. So I'll be fair about that. I don't want to establish that this correlation means that carbon dioxide is changing the atmosphere. But a statistician, a scientist, knows when you have correlation this strong, you look for the causal factor. Is there a reason? Is there a scientific link between those? And in fact, there is. Again, as the carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere, we know that it contains more of the infrared, the heat, that tries to escape into space. Now. Where are we currently? It is estimated that we are currently at 389 parts per million, which, if you think about it, is a good 20 or 30 percent above the all-time high for the last 800,000 years. Now, it has been higher. About 200, 200 million years ago or so, it was higher. But that was before the development of life on Earth. 
This is the highest that we have seen for 800,000 years. Shocking more still is where it is expected we will be by mid-century if we don't change what we're doing very quickly. Estimated to be at or above 600 parts per million, a doubling from the all-time high by middle of this century, just a few years away. I think most everyone in this room will either live that long or very close to it, or you have kids who will certainly be alive then. The youth delegation to the UN talks, they run around with teachers that say, how old will you be in 2050? Because they will still be alive. They will inherit this problem. I, by the way, am the oldest member of the international youth delegation. For some reason, I think like, I act like they do. They, they invited me to be a member. We have been measuring actual measurements, I'm not talking about estimations from bubbles of atmosphere. We have been actually measuring the climate of the planet since about 1850, so about 160 years. In that time, nine of the hottest, the, the 10 hottest years on record have been within the last 12 years. And I tried last night to find out something definitive in 2008. I couldn't find anything from a definitive source, but it looks like it was in the top 10. So it's going to push one of these off perhaps 1999. The statistic will stay the same. Is that cause for concern that nine of the last 10 years have been hottest on record? Well, I don't know what is if that's not. Two, 2005, the hottest year on record. And again, I want to call your attention to that because that will come up again. The quotation I'll give at this point, global CO2 must peak by 2015 and then decline rapidly to avoid catastrophic changes in Earth's climate that may lead to the extinction of 20 to 30 percent of all species by the end of this century and threaten the very survival of humanity. Now, don't think it's going to stop at the end of this century. That is a stick in the sand. We're looking at, again, it's called the sixth major extinction event, the first one of apparent human cause. This is from the IPCC report in 2007, the summary report at the end of 2007. Now, what I'll go into now is a group of what I call catastrophic failure modes. I'll explain to you where I derive these from as part, part way through the list. I'll give you nine. I'll ask you to read the nine silently. They'll come up with about two seconds to read each one. Get an impression, and then I'll discuss several of them. Disturbing list, each and every one of them. This is the first nine. I'll have another nine for you in a few moments. The first one, increased seismicity from polar ice melt. Now this is one where the science is not yet certain enough to say without a doubt. Scientists require 95 to 99 percent confidence level before they will say we're certain of this. You can say the preponderance of evidence is the weaker standard. That's about two-thirds probability. It, the jury is still out on this, but the current research seems to indicate that as you melt the ice on the Greenland continent, on Greenland, and on the South Polar ice cap, perhaps in the Himalayan ice cap as well, and all of that water flows into the ocean, what you're doing is you're depressurizing certain areas that have had a tremendous weight on them, and you're redistributing that weight as water in a thin band around the planet. Well, then you're changing the stresses on a very, very thin crust which floats on, on lava. Okay? Very clear how this might be a, a causal factor. But it is apparent, and I'll offer that because some, several scientists say that it is, it is certain to them that this is a, a factor in the increased uh, frequency of earthquakes, volcanism, and 
perhaps tsunamis, which are the results of earthquakes. And I know there's a very recent recollection of a very serious tsunami in this country. Let's take a look at the rising oceans. And some people mistakenly think that this is the big danger of global warming, that the oceans will rise. Well, we don't have to worry about it because it's not going to happen for a century or more. You know, I mean, it's not. This is, in my list of growing importance, this is one of the lowest of the importance ones. And still, it's not something to be joked about. The conservative data that I have indicates that with the first meter of sea level rise, there's an expectation of about 100 million people being displaced. With six meters of sea level rise, they estimate it to be closer to a half billion people will have to move. Their livelihoods will be uprooted. No homes, no family. Whether these things happen gradually or in shocks with storm events, with un unusually strong monsoons and hurricanes remains to be seen. But just to give you a little picture of what the issue is here in Bangkok, the Grand Palace, Wat Po, compliments of Google Earth. Take a look, a little aerial tour here. Here we can see Tonburi and the area around the, uh, the Forgetting the name of the river, right? Sorry. Jump right. Jump right. Yeah. Yeah. I had it right. I just didn't want to say it wrong. The blue area is what is expected to be underwater with the first meter, first two meters of sea level rise. The Chao Phraya is about one meter below the bank. This is a photo that I took recently. This is normal. This is not flood stage now. Is it a concern for Bangkok? I certainly hope the government has some contingency plan. Heat waves killing tens of thousands. This is, a again, an underestimate of the problem. When I say tens of thousands, you can think of more in terms of hundreds of thousands. But in the near term, this century, conservatively tens of thousands, because we've already seen tens of thousands. In 2003, there was an unusual heat wave in Europe where in areas it was as much as 10 degrees warmer than usual. It's estimated that between 30 and 40,000 extra deaths, again conservatively estimated, can be attributed to that heat wave. There are several countries that did not collect statistics. Germany, the health services say it was about 800 to 1,000, but the government had no official position on that. So just what the governments that actually released figures. Now, I wonder why Spain only had 100, but you saw from the graph that it was, let's go back for a moment. It did not have the heat wave as much, and probably they are used to dealing with heat more in Spain. Again, in terms of Thailand, 2007, all of these cities had record highs. Cause for concern? <coughs> Pandemics. And I'm highlighting the ones which are hair-raising for humans. I'm not even going to talk about the extinction of species. That's a harder one for us to get empathy for, unfortunately. One gentleman yesterday from the World Wildlife Fund came, <coughs> came and asked why I didn't highlight it. And I said, because it doesn't grab people as much for them to hear that oh, species will go extinct. If you can make the connection that we depend on these species, perhaps. But here's a dependence in a negative sense. These <coughs> vectors, disease vectors, are expanding their range, changing ranges, because climate is changing, because areas that were cooler are becoming warmer. Millions of acres of, of evergreen trees are being lost in the United States, in Alaska, because of a, a beetle, a borer which no longer gets killed off in, in extreme numbers over the winter. So they survive the winter in larger numbers, and there's a vast die-off of, 
of arboreal forest in the United States. But what this, the expansion of the range of these disease vectors means for human beings is a nightmare for the health services. There are also 30, quote, new diseases, that is, pathogens which have sprung to life, have, have uh, affected human, human populations to the point where it's a new disease, called a new disease. These are just 10. And I had H1N1 up yesterday, but I decided to take it out because I don't con consider it to be as, as much of a problem as it's hyped to be. We get flus every year that are more, apparently more serious than H1N1. But there are some things here which are quite of concern. The decimation of global economies. I don't have an image for you here. I'll give you a black image. We're going through what now is arguably referred to as a recession, like you call it a depression, whatever it is, we've got a problem. Now, of course, when the problem hits the pocketbook, governments of the world rally. They pick up the standard of bailout. Would that they would realize that we have a much bigger problem with the climate. Unfortunately, one of the aspects of the problem is that our economic system is faulty. It does not take into account the proper signals. It does not take into account the finite limited system of our planet, of the externalized costs. And externalized cost is, the concept is, if you don't have to pay for something, why pay for it? Why pay for health care for your employees if you're not forced to by government or by competition? Why pay for pollution control if you can go out back and dump your toxics on the ground and let them percolate into the, down into the water table, why pay for it until the government comes along and forces you to? So we have been doing these kind of unsound business practices for a while, and hopefully governments have gotten it together and, and stopped them, but there are still externalized factors which we are only now coming to grips with, and that primarily I'm referring to is the greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is one. Methane is much more potent, but shorter lived than carbon dioxide, much more potent, and I'll return to methane shortly. But the message I want to deliver here is that if you think we've got a problem with the economy now, you ain't seen nothing yet. In fact, there are people who are afraid that by the time humanity wakes up to the extent of the climate crisis, that the global financial system will be unsound and we'll, we will not be able to rally the capital to deal with it, that we must deal with it now before our financial system starts fraying. I'm sorry to bring such gloom and doom. I'm giving you a compendium of all the reading that I've done. The next three I group, three horsemen, shall we say, rampant political de destabilization, the failing states will fail, those that are are, are edgy now will become failing. The universal rise of militarism, regional and global resource conflicts and wars. Let me call your attention to just one problem, the Darfur problem, where in about 1963, Lake Chad started to dry up, the result of global warming, a change in climate patterns. Again, not just the heat of the planet, but that the rainfall pattern changed. As that lake dried up, all of those living on the edge, the uh, agrarian civilization living on the edge, was forced to move. And they migrated eastward into the, the area of the John Jewit, who were horsemen, who were herders. And so you had the age-old conflict of the, the farmer and the herder. And that's what we're seeing now in Darfur. The, the catastrophe in Darfur, the human catastrophe, is a one of the first major global warming problems that we've seen, climate problems that we've seen. Former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan finally called it a spade a spade and said that is a climate change problem. Now, what you've got here is the document, the source document that I have used to establish what I primarily to establish my list of 18 catastrophic failure modes. I'll recommend it. It's good reading. You don't have to read the whole thing. It's 120 pages. Six pages. The executive summary is quite enough. The executive summary gives you a very good 
thumbnail of what it's about here. You want to find in Google age of, the age of consequences and the initials CSIS, which is the initials of one of the two think tanks that sponsored it. Washington, D.C., National Security Think Tank, brought together a list of, of domain experts from various fields. There's a military uh, person in there. Two I'll call your attention to. James Woolsey was a former CIA director, privy to the inside scoop, the stuff that we never hear about at one point in time. John Podesta, name that's familiar to some in the United States, he was 50% of Barack Obama's transition team. He helped vet and pick the cabinet. The Obama cabinet and Barack Obama are completely aware of the problem. What they're dealing with, the reason they are not more aggressive, is because of the political reality in the United States, which is we have a very imperfect democracy, heavily influenced by financial uh, considerations. They call it they call it campaign contributions. It can be referred to less glamorously as a corruption of sorts, but money talks in the United States. In any case, we have our hands full in the U.S. trying to bring a very backward consensus to a recognition of what the problem is. I'm sorry to say. Excellent document, please. Uh, um, I have it on my laptop. If anybody has a thumb drive, you can get it from me directly afterwards. Let me give you another nine, if I haven't already ruined your appetite. Everybody seems to have finished eating. Can we also keep an eye on my time. Okay, about halfway through, I'm good. Oh, I'm sorry, I talked over my, my slide. Let's, uh, let's release the nine and let you read them one by one. to be toyed with here. Starting at the top, highly violent and frequent storm events. The climate of the planet Earth doesn't happen like that. It goes in waves, small waves and big waves. Storms, which have certain seasonality to them, there is consensus that the violence of storms is a direct, directly attributable to global warming, to climate change. The warmth in the oceans feeds the intensity of hurricanes, cyclones, uh, and typhoons. This funnel cloud appeared over Iowa in June 2008. Massive funnel cloud. Luckily, no one died. Hurricane Katrina, very famous, actually brought the proud United States to its knees, where other worlds were offering us help, emergency help. Partly the fault of a very backward, ill-prepared former presidential administration. Excuse me for Bush fashion, but. Typhoons in 2005, remember that hottest year on record, 2005. There was a record number of typhoons. There are 10 here, two at one time unusual. I'm told as we, as, we, as we flew from Japan to Bangkok this, on this trip, we were told that we would experience some bumpiness because of the ninth named storm event in the Pacific. Okay, the this, this season goes through the end of the year, and we've already had nine this year. Now, the, the frequency, it's not quite to the 95% level. But many scientists are saying that the frequency of storm events also increases. All we can say with certainty so far is the intensity increases. But excuse me, outside of scientific circles, it's very clear to me that the frequency increases as well. Flooding and drought. Almost a meter of rain in 24 hours in 2005. Again, that hottest year on record. The linkage there is as the planet warms, the oceans evaporate. 
the land transpires more moisture. So the atmosphere becomes more laden with water vapor. When the conditions are right for downpours, you get more rain, not the kind the farmers want. This kind of flooding is devastating to agriculture. It's not healthy. It's not stored. It runs off the roads, uh, uh, fields. It washes away crops. A year later, and again, nature does not really know 2005, 2006. Time blends together in natural cycles. 90% of the city underwater, 4 million people homeless. I'm in about India. Don't think this is limited to India. No nation of the world is immune from the ravages of climate change. Switzerland, that hottest year on record. Austria, that's a locomotive on its side. Dresden, Germany, and I had a, an argument with someone who saw my presentation once who said that this was 2003. I said, no, it was 2006, and we looked it up. There was the, the Rhine River overflowed its bank both years, 2003 and 2006. Thailand. Annual flooding is ordinary in Thailand, but the flooding will become more severe as time goes on. Adaptation will become more and more difficult. This record flooding in the United States in 2008, this was called a 500-year flood. Statistically, what that means is flooding of this extreme extent can be expected about once every 500 years. The problem is that the scale is changing. What was a 500-year frequency storm event is now becoming much more commonplace. The pattern is the same on every continent. And I want to point out that the pattern is not a linear pattern. The pattern is a scooping pattern, an exponential pattern. For those of you who are not scientific in orientation, the exponential relationship is one that seems to go along level until it reaches a certain point where it climbs very rapidly. The growth of human population, in fact, the growth, growth of any species, if it is given what it needs, will grow exponentially until it, it experiences some limitation in its environment. So of course, our effects on the planet are growing exponentially both because our population is growing and because the potency of our technology is growing. It's magnifying our numbers. But on every continent, you see the same or similar relationship. This does not include the data for the most recent decade, I'm sorry to say. I'll have to wait another year and a half or so until I have that data. Drought, the other side of the coin. Alpora, Spain, that hottest year on record, 2005. Kuruai Lake in the Amazon River Basin of Brazil. Now, the Amazon River is the largest river on Earth, drains more water from a greater land area than the next 10 rivers on Earth, the next 10 largest. This lake virtually went dry in that driest year, that hottest year on record. And not the entire river, but portions of the Amazon went dry for the first time in anyone's recollection. You can tell they would have parked this at a dock if it had been a seasonal expectation. Our ability to change the planet is unbelievable. Our ignorance of that is also unbelievable to me. Now, when I say ignorance, there are those that are exceedingly aware, but the population is not. Our governments seem to act as if they are not. I have a problem with this next one. You forgive me. When it... Whenever I present this one, I read, because it's so descriptive of the world, my children, I'm sorry that the yellow, I, I, I had a projector yesterday, which is the first projector I've ever seen which showed yellow well. You, you remember you saw this yesterday, and there's a big yellow aura around here where you only see a little bit of yellow. The slide on my laptop has a much greater aura of yellow, but we'll make the point clearer in a moment. What this slide says, and it's the result of some modeling done at Princeton University, 
you can see by the squares that it's a gross modeling. It's very difficult to, to model this kind of weather impact. But what this study came up with at Princeton University was that if you allow carbon dioxide to go to 600 parts per million, and remember that's where we're headed by mid-century, what you can expect is 20 to 30 percent drier soil in this part of North America, which is the, the heartland, the wheat belt, the corn belt of America. Now, I said I would fix that in a moment because if you allow it to go further, if you don't get on top of this problem immediately, and we bust through 600 and head on to 1,200 parts per million, you're looking at 50 to 60 percent drier soil conditions in the growing season and the collapse of agriculture in the United States. A little known fact is that in the NAFTA trade agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada, pressure was apparently being put on Canada for water rice. This is unacceptable, maybe unavoidable. Wildfires. Human beings do react well to, fi to fire. This is one of the things that may wake us up. In 2007, there was an unusual drought. Greece had so much fire that it almost brought down the government. It's a result not only of global warming, but of policy, because the Greek government allows the edges of national forests to be squatted, to be taken over by landowners if they are burned, if the trees are gone. So in the habit of burning land adjacent to yours and claiming that land is, is a long-standing one in Greece. Apparently, it got out of hand that year. I didn't realize that until I showed this slide, um, uh, and a, a fellow in the audience was Greek and told me that, that, that little bit of uh, happened again this year. happened again this year. Did it? Just outside of Athens. Me too. <laughs> yes, well, there was more said to be more fire in Greece that one month than in Europe for the entire 10 years preceding. I didn't follow the one in Greece, I'm sorry to say, but I know in Australia earlier this year how short our memory is. Australia burned mightily, and again, it was very directly attributable to global warming, to the local weather conditions. People were killed trying to escape the flames. The flames outran cars. And the pattern, Africa, the Americas, that very clear exponential pattern, Australia, Europe, and Asia. Again, I don't have the most recent decade. What it will show, I expect to be consistent with what you see there. The last two that I've saved, to me, are the worst that we are facing. Acidic oceans destroying the marine ecology. The idea here is that if you force more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, more of it will necessarily dissolve in the oceans. When you dissolve carbon dioxide in water, you get carbonic acid. That's what gives the soda pop its tang, that acidic uh, quality. There's also phosphoric acid, but carbon dioxide alone will do it. Seltzer water, carbon dioxide and water. So we are turning the oceans gradually more acidic with our carbon dioxide. And in fact, scientists were hoping that the oceans would bail us out and would accept more of the carbon dioxide, but we seem to be reaching saturation in the upper layers. So we are even pressing that sink. Scientists call it a sink when you can accept something, a waste product. By NASA's estimate, National uh, uh, Aeronautic and Space Administration in the United States, half of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean, from these tiny marine creatures, phytoplankton. Half of our oxygen. When we think of the lungs of the planet as being the trees, that's only half the story. We are challenging the survival of the phytoplankton because they need to form these calciferous exoskeletons, and that is inhibited as the waters turn more acidic. There are experiments going on where they're trying to encourage algal blooms as a way of sequestering carbon because, by the way, as those tiny algae die, 
they fall to the bottom, sequestering a lot of the carbon dioxide. This has been the process in the past, but the process is in the future we don't know. We are conducting an experiment on our own planet in real time. Climate change. Today's problem, not tomorrow's. And if we don't take action now to understand the changing nature of our planet and its impact, we will face extinction. By Rolf Tolle, Lloyds of London, whose business it is to analyze risk. Unacceptable risk we are um, bringing upon ourselves. And the last one of all that I'll discuss with you today, called runaway climate change. There's another name for it, but let me first explain something. Climate is said to be a nonlinear system. A linear system is one where it goes smoothly up and over and down and maybe varies. Those are linear relationships. A nonlinear system is one that goes along to a point where it changes state. It can be upward or downward in relative terms, but there are rapid changes in state. Nonlinear systems have what is called tipping points, and tipping points are breaking points. Now, these breaking points may be experienced in our time frame, in the rate at which we live our lives, as slow moving. But in fact, in geological times, they're extremely rapid. The warming of our planet in the recent years is extremely rapid. This is a tipping point. Notice the ocean behind that house that just went over. <coughs> This is in Nova Scotia. Tides are exaggerated in the northern latitudes, and tidal hot events, storm events, are even more exaggerated. So much of the coastal plain eroded away from high tides and, and storm events that finally it encroached on this town and several houses were lost. They caught that one on, on uh, video. Here's another example. I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to indicate the concept of permafrost to you, you may or may not be familiar with. Up in the northern latitudes, the ground has traditionally remained frozen virtually all year round, with perhaps the first six inches of foot going out in summertime, varying from one year to the next. But frozen in the subsoil to the extent that you could pour a very heavy concrete foundation and it would be stable until we started this, this treading this path of warming the planet. This house was uh, abandoned because the foundations were too heavy once the ground started thawing. This apartment building, designed by engineers, was designed on the faulty assumption that the permafrost was permanent. Permanent frost, permafrost. It was not permanent. They could not anticipate when they designed this. No one died in this. The cracking was noticed. The building was abandoned, and the, the building fell apart at some period later. That was in Alaska. Now, I'm using this as a precursor to what I'd like to show you next, which is if you look at Siberia and Alaska, the areas where we regard the permafrost as most threatened currently. Now, the bar graph you see here is an estimate of the atmospheric carbon dioxide estimated to be approximately 730 gigatons, billion tons. Okay, 730 billion is a big number. You multiply that by 2,000 in terms of pounds. Okay, that's a big number, a lot of zeros on that number. That's how much CO2 in the atmosphere right now. By the way, every gallon of gas, I'm sorry I haven't converted to liters, but every gallon of gas that's burned in a car emits about 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. Five gallons, 100 pounds. 100 gallons, about a ton just so you have a concept of what driving does. We were debating whether or not it's OK to take taxi cabs in Bangkok, because they're always going around anyhow, so you're just going in it. Well, excuse me, when they're, when they're cruising, they're going slowly. When, once you get in it, they're speeding to every light. I, somebody's got to write on a card for me, please slow down, because I have to be able to show that to the taxi drivers. Well. We are currently thawing the permafrost, and what scientists estimate is that we will double the amount of CO2 equivalent from that one source if we don't quickly reverse this trend. 
Now I say CO2 equivalent because what comes out of the ground is not CO2, it's methane. Methane is approximately 23 times as potent a greenhouse gas as CO2. That's the bad news. The good news, if you can call it that, is that methane degrades to carbon dioxide in a relatively short time, measured in tens of years. It has a half-life, shall we say. Unfortunately, in that degrading to CO2, it takes a lot of the oxygen out of the atmosphere as well. So this is not something that is good in that we're challenging the oceans to produce oxygen for us as well. I'm sorry I have such a negative story for you today. What you're seeing here is crystalline methane sublimating, coming directly into a, its vapor form, its gaseous form, in a Siberian lake. This is a phenomenon that has been noted in recent years. I don't know if it has the, the potential for explosion. If you went over there with a lit match, if it dissipates rapidly enough or if it's concentrated enough to explode, I'm not sure. It's not something I particularly want to try. Here's another example, though. In um, some some college students were out with their teacher. I believe that was also in Alaska. It was an experiment. You don't need to have a liquid lake for this to happen. It's not like the water has to get warm. It just has to get warmer at the bottom than the temperature at which methane is sequestered, is kept in its, its solid form. So we are already treading down that road of vaporizing methane. Now let me explain this idea of runaway climate change. It's also called the Venus Syndrome. I'll tell you how it got that name here. Take a look at the Earth. Now the blue is an exaggeration of our atmosphere, but it's meant to represent our relatively thin atmosphere. Compared with Venus, cloud shrouded Venus with a much thicker atmosphere. Those clouds in the atmosphere of Venus are the oceans of Venus. Venus was believed to have once had liquid water on it, I believe. If you compare it, if you strip away the clouds, you've got a very hot planet, 450 degrees C approximately, as opposed to 15 degrees C average temperature of the Earth. Now, the temptation will be to say, oh, that's because Venus is so much closer to the sun. If this was 100 miles, this would be about 60 miles. So it's closer, yes. But if you compare to Mercury, which is much closer still, with a very thin, thin, almost non-existent atmosphere, much cooler, much closer to the sun, much cooler, because it doesn't have that atmosphere to trap the heat. Scientists tell us that approximately 300 degrees C of that number is an atmospheric forcing. Very clear what that should mean as opposed to about 50 degrees of atmospheric forcing on Earth. So the original blanket of CO2 that we inherited is actually good. Life would not have developed the way it has if we had not had some microbe that was emitting carbon dioxide. You know, our, our atmosphere was created by microbial sources that allowed us to, to develop. But if we play around with that atmosphere, there's a concern that we may do this to the planet Earth. The actual name Venus Syndrome was coined after Stephen Hawking said that he was afraid that the Earth might end up like Venus. He stated that at a conference that he was at when he was asked the question about global warming. And James Hansen, who is the preeminent scientist in the United States, he's been saying it longer and louder than anyone. Presidents have tried to get him fired, been unsuccessful. For over 30 years, he's been saying this since it was, no, global warming. The danger we now face is the Venus Syndrome. There is no escape from the Venus Syndrome if, tr if triggered. Venus will never have oceans again. December of 2008, he also said, we have reached the point of a planetary emergency. How the governments of Earth can ignore this is beyond me, is absolutely beyond me. Whatever your nationality is, it is incumbent upon you to put pressure on your own government to wake up. If 
they're arguing about dollars and cents, about rubles and pounds. They are arguing away the future of the planet. <laughs> this is from a paper that I received a couple of weeks ago. I've been distributing it carefully because it's the kind of thing that I think could, well, could promote panic, but I think we need a little bit of panic hereabouts. The author, David, Dr. David Wassell of, of UK, this one graph will tell you the whole thing, and the quote, the current analysis indicates very high probability of a potentially unstoppable condition of runaway climate change with catastrophic consequences. That's geek speak for look out. His analysis is that we have already strayed over the edge into the runaway climate change zone, and that we are negotiating the wrong thing at the United Nations. We are trying to divvy up this imaginary carbon budget in a fair manner, fair manner between nations, when in fact we have no carbon budget left. We've squandered it. The real pity of this whole thing is that the signals are so delayed from the damage. We've already done enough damage to kill ourselves. We need to wake the governments of Earth up very quickly. This is the web address. I can give you the paper. I have it on my, my laptop if you like. If you'll do a card swap with me later, I can provide you with my sources. Give you a little bit of a breather at the end here. Is there any hope? Well, I wouldn't be here if there wasn't. Grouping it really quickly, technical solutions. There are lots of technical solutions. The one that I'll highlight is something I found, which I think is a winner, called biochar. Apparently, the Amazonian indigenous peoples knew that if you worked enough carbon into the soil, it would become very fertile. And they find pockets of very dark black soil. They carbon date it. They know it goes back thousands, a couple thousand years. There are scientists who are doing a lot of research on this now because it, the, if you create a char out of any biomass, you can use the volatile parts as feedstocks for energy, liquid fuels. You can look for medicines, for pharmaceuticals in those feedstocks. Chanel number no. five, one of the secret ingredients, is a fractional distillate of rosewood, a Brazilian hardwood. There's a gold mine, excuse my, my reference, in, in the, the field of biochar. I have five slides on it. I'm only showing one today because I only had an hour today. Lots of things that can be done, but they are not enough. Political solutions, now that is key. That is the key solution, the political solution, not happening fast enough. The political solution this year, Copenhagen Treaty being negotiated in the final three meetings of the year. I am intervening in each of these three meetings with a project that I've started, I'll mention in a moment. This will help determine the fate of Earth. It will not be over in Copenhagen. It will not be a strong enough agreement. I can guarantee you that. Societal solutions. I call myself a social engineer. I quite deliberately put a little bit of white knuckles in the room when I speak because this is a very worrisome thing. I don't want to panic anyone into saying, ah, screw it, I'm just going to go and buy myself a Hummer, get myself that jet plane I always wanted, we're all going to die anyhow. That's not what it's about. Now, in terms of societal solutions, philosophically, let's say, if we can learn and exemplify in our own lives that we need to waste less. There is a estimated to be a 40% save in our energy usage just in energy conservation measures. Easy stuff, low-hanging fruit. That's one of the quickest things we can do. Look at all the light we, we, we waste. This is a, a, a composite of NASA photography, nighttime photography. much more difficult one, if we can learn to want less. Now, this hedges at a more spiritual territory, and I'm going to go there in a moment. 
And I say, despite, despite society's pressures, I don't want to offend anybody in the room, or maybe someone from the advertising industry, but what we're talking about there is an industry devoted to making us unsatisfied, to making us want more, unsustainable. We have to learn to want less, learn and teach. As I'm going to use your quote every time I present now. As Edward said to me yesterday, he heard a quote, I have to find the quote, the source of it. Everyone wants to change the world, no one wants to change themselves. Consumerism is unsustainable. We need to change the economic paradigm of society very quickly. Now, a bit of social engineering. There's a movie that's going to premiere on the 22nd in Bangkok. It's a global premiere. It'll be the 21st in Europe and the United States, but 22nd in Bangkok on this side of the dateline. It will premiere, ironically, at the Siam Paragon, which I call the temple of the religion of consumption. <laughs> Please, attend the first night. Please, put it on your schedule. Get tickets early. Bring your family, bring your friends. It is the, it is a, it does not have the backing of a major studio. It will not be advertised in the newspapers. The success of the movie, the number of eyes that see it will depend on how well it does in the box office, how much buzz it gets. I've been spreading the word for over a year. I've seen it five times. I've shown it twice at the United Nations climate conferences. Oh, let me. Let me go back. I want to give you the, uh, the, the uh, idea of what it's about before I go and show you the trailer. It's a documentary. It follows the lives of six people, very interesting characters that have been picked. It's got one actor in it who binds it all together, Peter Postlewaite, who's a famous Shakespearean actor. You may recognize him. I was told he was in some of the James Bond movies playing M. He is the archivist. Somehow he has assembled the remain remainder of the world's computer knowledge on a series of servers in this huge archive that sits at, atop a stanchion somewhere in the North Sea. And he rides his bicycle up to his computer, and you sit behind the computer screen looking out at him as he calls up the evidence of, that we ignored in the early part of the 20th, 21st century, wondering how it was we could have let this happen to ourselves. He's in the theoretical year 2055. Take a look. Observing people on a far off beach, running around in circles, fixated on the small area of sand under their feet as a tsunami races towards the shore. 101 degrees Fahrenheit, it's the hottest day ever recorded. It is our fault, of course. We're worried about global warming. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, This is the most important film of the year, perhaps of, of our, our times. World <coughs> premiere, September 22nd. Please write that down. Please go if you can. It's Tuesday, next Tuesday. Yes, yeah, very soon. Tickets are on sale now, I believe. You can reserve the tickets. 
see you all there, I hope. And spiritual solution. And I'm sorry I'm a little bit over my time budget. I got a little carried away here today. I thought I could nail it in an hour. The reason I'm in Bangkok is because I had an epiphany with all that I've experienced and learned. I realized that there was an underutilized channel of communication which I'll refer to as the interfaith or spiritual channel, where I define spiritual very broadly. 85% of the world's people are said to belong to one religion or another, but the remaining 15% also are ethical people. Well, if you combine ethics and spirit and call that interfaith, then we have most of the people of the world. And I realized that if we could mobilize that channel that we could perhaps change the terms of engagement. Because I regard the problem as not predominantly a physical problem. The effects, the visible part, is physical, of course. The problem is a spiritual problem. We have gotten divorced from our roots. We don't understand the impact. We don't understand the ethical component. Our economy, our pol political system, is devoid of that notion of ethics. It has to be reintroduced with CSR. Please go to this website, if you would. It's a one-page declaration that we've come to. It's being endorsed by many people, both religious and non-religious. The Dalai Lama was our first notable signatory. He actually helped us edit it to make it more inclusive, since there were some references that we didn't see, which were more or less Judeo-Christian. He said, well, as a Buddhist, I can't sign it. So we got his, we understood. OK. Now, we will be hosting an event, actually two events. One of them is inside the UN, so I can't inv uh, invite you to that unless you're a member of the press, in which case it's pretty easy to get in. But the panel discussion will be public. It will be in the 14 October 1973 Memorial Auditorium. There's the address. There will be details on our website. All you need to remember is Interfaith Declaration. Wednesday, September 30th, 3 to 5. Please come. Please put it on your schedule. It will be a very interesting uh, presentation. It will be the first of three times we will do this. We'll do this here, we'll do it in Barcelona, and we will do it in Copenhagen. And we have invited the Pope to participate in Copenhagen. We are trying to negotiate that. Long shot, but heard of stranger things coming to pass. We are a tiny speck of dust in outer space, just so we don't get too carried away with our importance in the universe. That's the Earth from 4 billion miles away. There is no place that we can escape to. The Bush administration tried to change people's awareness away from climate problem by mounting another attempt to man an expedition to the moon and, and Mars. We are not close enough to Mars not for any significant number of people to get there or survive there. We are alone. That is our home planet. We cannot afford to lose it. Thank you very much. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, let me give you one little bit of social engineering before I go. Can you put out your two hands for a moment? In your left hand, can you imagine all of the wasteful old habits in your personal life? And in your right hand, the new habits that you'll try to emulate, that you'll try to teach to others. Old habits, new habits. And then just put your hands together. Thank you. There's also a desalination process due to the uh, 
October 1, uh, melting of Asia, <coughs> making uh, fresh water in Lake South Dakota, the yes. ocean water. And I don't know if you've seen, you've, you've seen probably if people have seen the movie uh, Day After Tomorrow. Yes. David Quay. And um, an exaggeration, it's an exaggeration of a real phenomenon. I have thousands of slides. I have to leave most of them out when I present. I have a series of slides on that issue. Yes, the glacial melt, the ice pack melt in, in, on Greenland is diluting the North Atlantic overturning currents to the point where it's slowing, and they're expecting that the climate of Europe will change radically. Uh, this happened once before geologically in the, last, the end of the last ice age where Europe was cast into a, another mini ice age by a vast lake of water that goes through, this is part of the Gore movie, that we did that overturning current. It's a separate issue from the acidification of the ocean. Separate issue. There are lots of other ocean problems. There are dead zones, hypoxic, they call. Not enough oxygen to support life. There are hypoxic zones developing in the ocean as a result of, of misuse of uh, land, misuse, agricultural misuse, and other reasons. But there are many problems with the ocean, so not to mistake the acidification problem with, with the uh, uh, fresh water salination pool. One problem that is associated with the acidification that I did not mention is that the world's coral reefs are threatened. I presented that yesterday. I had an hour and a half. Today I had an hour. The coral reefs are going through bleaching phenomenon, nothing to do with chlorine. It's a phenomenon where there is a certain threshold where if you warm the water and you slightly acidify the water, coral, which depends upon the ability to, to bring calcium out of the water to make a, an exoskeleton like those tiny plankton, can't do it. So for the same reason the plankton are endangered, the coral reefs are endangered. 16% of all coral reefs on Earth are said to have died in one year, 1998, because of a, a, a warmer, more acidic ocean that one year. They don't come back. Some do, but once they're dead, they're dead. Okay. Um, you're saying that some scientists are saying we're very close to <coughs> or have gone across the point of no return. Yes. And, um, and, you, uh, and, the, and the extension of Kyoto that we're negotiating in Copenhagen is really nowhere near enough. It's a non so, so what should governments be negotiating in Copenhagen? I'm not a political scientist. I don't know that I can synthesize that uh, in, in, in simple terms. But what needs to happen is something on the order of a, what would happen if there was an invasion of the Earth by an alien species? If there was a real enemy that we could rally together to defeat, if that was necessary? Well, we are the enemy. We have to somehow rally together to defeat our old habits, to defeat a system which is not working. We have to wake up quickly enough to, to put out a grand prize, the equivalent of a Nobel Prize, for not one, but advances which will bring our economy into alignment with the limitations of our planet. I'm fishing that out of, of I haven't thought about this before. You're asking me. I gen, tend to be pretty good at shooting from the hip, and part of that is Spiritually, I ask for the Creator to help me find the right way to stop. You mentioned biochar as one of the solutions, and presumably that would come from sources of biomass. Um, but there's many environmental scientists who argue that there's really no biomass left to use, um, since we're already using over 50% of usable land for agriculture, and the other 50% we need for being the lungs of the earth, turning over the other 50% oxygen that you mentioned in each so my question is, where, where would we get the materials for the biochar to be effective and that being an effective solution? And that being technical in nature, I'm not even going to try to field that one, except I would put you in touch with those people, the, the International Biochar Institute, I think IBI, the, the letters, and good question. I, I would say field it with them, because that's a macroeconomic question that I'm not qualified to answer. Except there's so much waste that's done now, if you even diverted some of that waste. Instead of burning the 
the, the rice stuff, instead of burning the, the leftovers from the rice in northern Thailand as is done, setting off the, the forest fires in Thailand that occur every, every spring, if that could be uh, uh, char charred instead. Instead of taking, um, well, I said I would, I would hesitate to answer. That's, that's one that I'll, I'll give you my insights from my little knowledge of biochar afterwards, but it's, I'm inexpert enough that I don't want to I don't want to go there in front of the entire group. Good question. I have a last question. Uh, yes, Stuart, regarding you know, your, your long list of possible catastrophes. Uh, Not possible. Likely. Likely. Yeah, or almost certain. But anyway, um, the Himalayan glaciers, right, and the uh, seven or eight rivers in India and China that, that depend on them. I've seen no uh, hard estimates, but the references that, that come to mind are, are, we're talking about very serious impacts by the end of the century. That is, um, the melting is occurring rather rapidly. A sizable part of the Himalayan ice pack could be gone by the end of the century if we want to reverse the trend. You know, I mean, the end of the century is still pretty far away, uh, regrettably, even though, I mean, the time to act is now. But, um, well, let me, is it really likely that it would take that long? Let, let, let me see, to, again, <laughs> the difficulty with exponential relationships is when you're in them, you can't tell where in that curve you are until you look backwards. Okay, So you don't know. Um, but I will say that the paper that I quote there with that, that nice rainbow colored hump in it, um, that paper puts an, uh, an estimate in terms of the amount of temperature increase as uh, upwards of 10 degrees C by the end of the century, 4 to 6 by the middle of the century, by 2050. So imagine a world 4 to 6 degrees hotter on average all over the world within your lifetime. As we say in Brooklyn, you should live somewhere. Um, that's an inch of that, I guess you can get it if you know anybody who comes from New York. I'm looking at the one person who's probably American besides, no, no you're not, oh, uh, I guess wrong. That's my time then. You are? No, I guess wrong there, okay. Oh, Thank you very much. I don't know whether I'm going to be welcome to come back or not. And you can give the jokes. Yeah, I'll give you guys a round of applause for